Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Moon. The Garage Gym Athlete Podcast is a result of my desire to build better humans, unequivocal coaches, and autonomous athletes. I've spent the last several years obsessing over program design, nutrition, and every other way you can optimize human performance. This podcast distills the latest scientific research with what I've learned and blends it with the not-so-scientific field of mental toughness. We are here to build you into a dangerously effective athlete. If you enjoy this podcast, you can find out more about our training at garagegymathlete.com. And if you want to pursue more into the field of coaching and programming, head to endof3fitness.com. Thanks for listening. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. Jerry Moon here with Ashley Hicks. How's it going, Ashley? Good. And Joe, how you doing, man? Life goes on. We were joking. I, maybe it was just me. I was kind of joking before the podcast started. Since this isn't video, Joe kind of looks like Robin <laughs> Williams from Jumanji. Like after he comes back from the jungle and he's mm-hmm. got like just this ridiculous beard and everything else. Joe is definitely pulling that off right now. I don't want to say I'm pulling it off, but it's happening. You're yeah. You're like, I don't know, not when he comes out of the jungle, but you're somewhere in his jungle journey right now. Like, I don't know what I feel a bit lost in life too. (laughs) (laughs) So let's just start with you, Joe. Give us some, some updates, man. How, how are things? I got nothing going on right now. Uh, yeah, pretty uneventful. Just, trying to keep on keeping on the COVID <laughs> updates are just getting better and better. It goes like chapstick down to look, I don't have anything to say. Okay. Move on. <laughs> yeah, like, what, what do you want from me? All right. Uh, a lot of cardio because I don't have any, any equipment lifting the same, you know, 115 pound bar, barbell. Cause that's all I can do. <laughs> and that's it. Progressively getting fuzzier. I do clean up the neck because that's just, that's, I just can't handle that. But anything yeah, else that bothers me so much. I can like have a bad day if I didn't shave my neck. Uh, yeah, not the first day, but like a few days and it'll just start making me angry. It's like, got it. Anyway, we've already spent too, too much time there. Ashley, how, how's life? I wouldn't know about shaving my neck, but, uh, life is good. Sure? Yeah, no, wouldn't know about that. My grandparents or my grandparents, Connor's grandparents are in town. My dad and my stepmom are in town. So it's been pretty awesome because every morning he wakes up and he, I'm chopped liver but I'm not mad about it. Like, it's pretty great. He runs straight to either. My dad is pop pop to him. So he wakes up and goes pop pop. Then he runs right at him or uh, he can't say you then. it's great. It's really nice. So and they're, they're pretty awesome. So we've been to the beach once, maybe go back. We'll see if the weather holds out here, but yeah, that's pretty much life right now. That's great. My life is um, as it, as it always has been. Um, I don't have a lot of updates, <laughs> a lot of updates either. Just, uh, training, you know, putting in the work, going through life slowly. Um, I can see the end of the tunnel of, of the book is, is my, I mentioned last time, my life has been the book recently and it's, I can kind of not be that way anymore. Like, obviously I, I still want everybody to get the book. I love the reviews I've been getting from the book. Like just the feedback from the community has been awesome and I appreciate everybody who's gotten it. There's still a lot of things left to do in, in the book world, you know, over the next couple of months, just to make sure it it gets its proper send off. Uh, but a lot of the, the hard effort and heavy lifting on that is, is over. But, uh, the next step is the audio book. And that's kind of my announcement for today. If you want to get the audio book, you can go to killingcomfort.com. There's a little button there. To get the audiobook, you can get Amazon. You can click the Amazon button and go buy it, or you can get the audiobook. And we are actually selling the audiobook through the website, which is pretty cool because um, we can control the price and give it at a very low introductory price. So much lower than it will be. I, again, this is, this is what's bothered me about Amazon and even Audible. You can't control the prices on anything. So, like, if you wanted to be like, hey, you've been listening to the podcast for a year. I want to, you know, give you something for, for being awesome. How about a, a discount on the, you can't do it. They're like, no, like and, and with audible. And, and this is probably more behind the scenes that people even want to know. They just, they just are, they pick the price for you. You can't even like 
say it. Like if you want to charge a lesser price, you can't, if you want to charge more, you can't. So anyway, uh, it will be on audible eventually, but it won't be on audible like right now. Um, it'll be there, I don't know, a week or two. So if you want to get on audible and use your credit, you absolutely can. But right now it's available at our website. You can get it. And what's really cool. What we've done is it's a, essentially a private podcast feed, um, that you get access to after you purchase it. And so if you're like, oh, I don't want this like big audio file of like an audiobook, it'll pull up in your podcast player, whether you're Android or Apple, you just click a few buttons and it opens directly. I've already tested it out super easy. And then you can listen to it. If you're listening to this right now, you can listen to the audiobook. It's that simple. And so go to killingcomfort.com if you want to snag the audiobook. I know a lot of people are waiting on that. And uh, I'm an audiobook consumer as well. And then if you want to wait for the audible version, it will be out. Um, not, not too far behind the release of this one, probably like two weeks or so. Uh, so yeah, that's the, the update on the book. And again, thank you for all the support, all the kind words, and just for, for purchasing it. And if you want the audio book, go grab it. But that's, that's my update. It's my life right now. May is a crazy month. That's going to be my official update. So for me, May, this May specifically, 10-year wedding anniversary. It's my dad's birthday. It's my son's birthday. It's Emily's grandma's birthday who lives really close to us. So that actually does factor in. Um, there's one, oh, Mother's Day, which is a big one. There's just a lot of things that happen in May. So when I arbitrarily picked the book launch date, <laughs> I think I made a mistake, but next time I launch a book, it just won't be in May. It'll probably be June <laughs> or, or March, April, something like that. You know, might be safer. Of- there's been a lot of, for my next book, I'm going to do this or I'm not doing this next time I'm doing a book. So <laughs> there's also been a lot of, <laughs> there's also been a lot of, Hey, if I say I want to write a book again, tell me no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, uh, thanks for all the support and uh, all that, but we're going to get into the study for this week, which is, I pulled up. The study is actually called a pretty cool title twice as high diet-induced thermogenesis after breakfast versus dinner on high-calorie as well as low-calorie meals. That is the name of the study, and it's also very revealing. So diet-induced thermogenesis um, is essentially just a caloric burn from food in and of itself. Uh, If you've heard of, I was just talking to Joe about this before the podcast, like if you've ever heard someone say um, celery has negative calories, it's pretty interesting. I've never actually looked into see if that's true, but I've heard that before. And that means that there's very few calories in celery, but everything your body does takes energy to include digesting the food. So if you were to eat 10 calories worth of celery, it might take your body 15 calories to burn it. And that's true of any and every food. There's, there is a, a burning component that takes energy to burn the food. Uh, so that is what we're kind of talking about. And so the study itself, um, researchers examined 16 men, no women, below the ob- obesity or overweight BMI thresholds. Participants were required to self-report a regular sleep-wake cycle. Shift workers were excluded, be non-smokers, not taking any kind of medication or drugs, not have been dieting and to have no neurological, psychiatric, or metabolic diseases during the six weeks prior to the study. Uh, And they basically put them in a ward um, in the lab for three days, and they either fed them most of their calories in the morning and less in the evening or the opposite of that, right? And I don't know if I need to break down or if you guys want to go over any more, we can, but like the specific, they give us the, the carbohydrate, protein, and fat, the macro breakdown that they did, and what percentage of calories were in the morning. And maybe we could talk about those things if someone's looking to implement this stuff, but that's the basics of the, of the study. They fed them more during the morning um, and less in the evening, or they flipped that and they were wanted to see uh, what was better for burning more calories uh, through diet induced thermogenesis. So Joe, what are your takeaways, man? The first one I was getting into this, it was, it seemed pretty simple because, you know, you've always been told kind of to eat a little bit less at night. You know, the, the, uh, the old saying, but eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, and dinner like a peasant. That's always what I was kind of told. I've never said. heard that before. I love really? it. There's a couple different versions of it, but yeah, that's basically how it goes. Well, I didn't, uh, I didn't get to the findings real quick, so that way we're, they're not 
overlooked, but essentially, it was, what it was two point five times higher of thermogenesis. Yeah, yeah, of thermogenesis for the morning, eating more of your calories. I think it was sixty nine percent of your calories in the morning versus at night. So two point five times more um, of dit diet induced thermogenesis in the morning. Then it's not a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like saying that over and over again. So for the rest of the post- podcast, I would like to say it, dit. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, so that was the findings. Breakfast breakfast one out there. So or yeah. takeaways. Yeah. But taking a simple concept and how, how many measures and uh, tra- uh, metrics they, they did for this was, uh, was really cool. And the fact that, like, you know, you'd think they would just do a protocol of, like, okay, here's what you should eat for dinner. Here's what you should eat for breakfast. Here's about your calories. But they actually, like, had them in this ward – control their calories completely and uh, factored for sleep as well. Um, and I, I don't, I, I'm not sure if they actually took measurements during the sleep or whatever. They just gave them like, Hey, you know, you need to sleep between these hours and then um, took blood samples throughout. So I thought it was really cool to you know really break down why you should have basically front load your, your meals throughout the day and get your, get your big breakfast um, in and then just kind of fulfill the rest of your calories at, uh, for dinner. Science proved it. Ashley, what are some of your takeaways? Um, so they, for these people that they uh, basically took part of the study, they didn't, they weren't really training. They were, they even talked about like different ways that they were able to like go about their day, which was a lot of sitting, a lot of, so I was, at first I was shocked at, they took their, basically their BMI and times it by 1.2, which is like the lowest, um, well, one of the lowest ways you can, you know, adjust people's macros. So at first I was like, man, that's kind of low for everyone to do that. But then I realized, okay, well, they weren't training. Um, so they were already on kind of like a shed plan in my personal opinion. Um, and then how they spread the meals out, like the meal time was 9 a.m., 2 p.m., and then 7 p.m. So it was just super spread out in my personal opinion as well because they talked about like hunger pains and whatnot. And of course, I feel like if you're going to eat a bigger breakfast, you're going to feel full and satiated. But at the same time, I was looking at the percentages, the differences between the fat, the protein, and the carbohydrates, and it was super low on protein. Did anyone mm-hmm. else feel the same way? 18% protein. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, and like 40-something percent carbs. 46, yeah. I loved like, it. That's... <laughs> that's <laughs> A lot of carbs. And then they add, added uh, maltodextrin. So that's even more glucose into like what they took in. So I was just very shocked at, at that. Um, but they talked to, um, I guess the last meal before bedtime, I, their bedtime too, their hours that the, when they had to sleep was only, if you looked at the time, it was like 1130 to, I believe seven it was something. seven. Yeah. yeah. So it's only seven and a half hours that they allotted for sleep. And let's say, you know, you didn't fall asleep at 1130. I don't know. I just, this was a lot of stuff that I was, uh, I get the whole, you know, if you have more calories at breakfast and feel fuller, longer that, and I agree with that. But there was a lot of factors that I just, I wish things would have been different or changed. Yeah. Um, what I find interesting, so they, it's reported as 2.5 times higher. But if you pull up figure four, I mean, after you eat food, <laughs> thermo, diet-induced thermogenesis, as, as it s- sounds, diet-induced thermogenesis is going to be higher. It doesn't matter when you eat. You could wake up in the middle of the night and have some food and dit is going to be higher <laughs> just because it, it takes calories uh, for your body to burn it. Uh, so some of my issues with the study, one, I think it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool finding. But again, uh, they, not really, they weren't highly trained. And so I think that's a big factor to take into account. But at the same time, I agree. I, there are a lot of studies that say if you eat a ton of your calories at night that that's bad. It's going to disrupt your sleep. What I find interesting is the fat burn fix uh, by Kate Shanahan, which I'm almost finished with. um, She, she actually um, suggested the opposite. She suggested that you eat more later. She, she didn't say specifically what time. And that was the first person I've ever actually heard say that. And her argument was 
and I kind of agree with the logic. I just don't know if the science backs it up is that if you are eating a lower carbohydrate diet, way off from 46% of your, your calories, eating a lower carbohydrate diet, you exercise, um, and you fast that your glycogen stores may be depleted. And so loading up on them later in the day should be fine if your glycogen stores are in need of being replaced. If they're not in need of being replaced, then this study makes a lot of sense to me. And I, but I think that's something that is the only thing that was overlooked, and I don't know if they could control for it. And I guess that was my biggest issue was glycogen. Because if, you are, if, you don't, if you're out of glycogen, um, your body is going to start using fat. To, for energy. And that's a good thing. You want your body to be using fat at, throughout the day and as much as possible. We've talked about that in zone two training and everything else. Uh, so what I think they've found here is the best way to manage your diet if you're not going to be, I, I mean, if you're not going to implement any other strategies, then this is a great way to like adjust your calories. And it's probably just, you know, sound advice, but there was another study I pulled. This study is 30 years old. It's crazy, right? But um, <laughs> science is science. And it's called the effects of short-term carbohydrate overfeeding and prior exercise on resting metabolic rate and DIT, dye-induced thermogenesis. They didn't, <laughs> they didn't write DIT. I did. I said it. Um, anyway, let me just kind of read the results here. Um, so what would they do? Subjects performed maximum work capacity test on a cycle ergometer and then they cycled for a total of approximately 80 minutes at fixed percentages of their maximum work capacity. Carbohydrate overfeeding did not affect RMR, but increased DIT significantly on average by 39%. Glycogen depleting exercise the day before increased RMR significantly by on average 9% and increased DIT on average by 23%. The impact of exercise and RMR was less when carbohydrate overfeeding was administered, but there was no significant interaction effect of carbohydrate overfeeding and exercise on RMR or DIT. It is concluded that both prior glycogen depleting exercises and an antecedent diet high in carbohydrates may influence RMR or DIT. So that, what does all that mean? It just means that your, the exercise to all this, what you're doing physically is a huge factor and makes a, a big difference. And Joe, I feel like that was one of your points, maybe before we even started talking or, or maybe when we were chatting earlier was like, if you train at different times, wouldn't this, wouldn't this be factored differently? Like if you train later, could you eat later or something? I think, I think you were the one who mentioned yeah, that. Yeah, I mentioned right? that because a lot of our athletes, so a ton of people train first thing in the morning, just get out of the way, but there are some people that need to train in the evenings and have asked and worried about, you know, okay, since I'm training in the evenings, how am I going to get all my recovery in and how are the calories going to be adjusted uh, likewise? And I think, at least to me, the recovery should be almost similar. So I don't know if people are, I, I hope people aren't training after dinner. I feel like that'd be awkward, but, but it happens. Like I've had to do that before. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, not re I don't really do that anymore, but there was like a significant period of my life. Let's say two years where I did that every day. I ate dinner, put kids to sleep and trained at night. I was, I was in a, in the military. Um, and, and that's what I wanted to cover because what I'm afraid people pull from these studies, like the ultimate finding is if you can, um, even if you want to fast, fast, eat a big meal, eat most of your calories first. And then like Joe said, king, queen, peasant throughout your day, that's a great way to remember it. But if you are in a, the opposite situation is who I'm more concerned about when doing this podcast, because you might be like, ah, I can't do that. I'm not optimizing, you know, things I can't eat in the morning, more in the morning, whatever if you are exercising at a higher intensity for 60 to 80 minutes, as that study suggests, your diet induced thermogenesis skyrockets, you know, so it's, it's going to be okay. Like you're, you're going to burn a lot more calories, not only from the exercise, but the refeed portion is going to be okay as well. So just keep that in mind. I think, I think that, that that was the only thing they didn't look at in this study. So I had to pull another one to kind of prove that point, but it's really important. Um, I think to factor in, like you're going to be okay, but there is an optimal way to do things. And it's as the study suggests, eat early. Yeah. They also took, I, I kind of like the subjective measures that they took, which, um, they were asking like after a couple hours after eating their, those meals, uh, like after breakfast, the low calorie one, people were, were more hungry because obviously they didn't have it as much, but throughout the day, uh, the higher calorie breakfast were less hungry. They had less hunger, 
Um, and they also didn't have cra- uh, sweet as much sweet cravings, which was uh, kind of cool, especially because, I mean, here their calories are completely accounted for and like allotted to them. But in the outside world, you're, you're not that way. So you might be more likely to snack more if you're doing the low calorie breakfast versus the higher. Uh, so it's another just small little thing. Yeah. What do you guys actually do? I don't, I would say I don't do king, queen, peasant. I'll, I'll let you know what I got, what I do, but I'd be curious to, and if you don't know exactly, but just ballpark it, what do you think you guys do? Like how do you, oh. how like calorie wise, like how much do you think you break your calories up throughout the day? My scrambles are fit for a king. So you do, you do that. You eat most yep. of them, right? But you fast too, right? Yep. So you're breaking your fast still AM. Yeah. breaking the fast, a lot of calories, and then just a little bit less throughout the day. Yeah. Um, I, I don't really have a traditional lunch. It might be like a small like kind of snack. The lunch might be my smallest meal, and then my dinner will have um, a, a little bit more, but it's usually somewhat lower in carbs, but still like not a huge, huge meal. I try not to at least. So breakfast is definitely the biggest uh, meal. What do you do, Ashley? So I break my fast at 9. I work out. I train at 8. And I do a post-workout pretty decent smoothie. I actually talked about it a little bit in our Slack chat this, with the Huel and protein. And I get berries and spinach and lots of goodness. And then I'm pretty full until about um, – I do eat a smaller lunch. I agree with you, Joe. And then I don't eat like a massive dinner, but I do eat more than I do at lunch at dinner. So, If I had to guess – if I should actually break it down. I would think mine are about equal. I would say it's like almost like 33%, 33%, 33%. I basically eat three times per day. Uh, so break the fast, but none of them are overly large. And I would also, I also think I probably consume a majority of my carbohydrates between my last two meals, not my first one. And this is just something. And the reason I'm sharing it is because this is what I found. This is my N equals one. And there's a lot of science that proves and disproves this fact, but I am fully in the camp that I think insulin screws with everything and affects everything. And it's just super true for me. So if I eat, if I were to have like wake up at six and say I ate a gigantic breakfast with a lot of carbohydrates at seven, I'm going to have a bad work day. And I mean, mentally, like I'm not going to be thinking very clear for me, for some reason, I try to keep a majority of my day and in my mornings are my most productive time. I try to stay away from carbohydrates almost altogether or like less than 20. Like I, I, and that's partly like ketogenic type thinking, but I stay away from carbohydrates until after I've trained. Then after I train, I have a bigger meal, which would be my lunch. Good amount of carbohydrates in that one. Uh, and then a decent amount. That's probably my largest carbohydrate meal after I train. And then, uh, more in, in the evening, but that's just how I work because almost all of my diet decisions, whether or not I drink alcohol, um, everything has to do with my mental clarity, like everything. Like I don't drink, I don't drink, like I don't drink alcohol really like very, very, very occasionally. And everything behind me not drinking alcohol has to do with how my brain works the next day and nothing to do. I don't care about my resting heart rate being higher, my heart rate variability being lower, like, I don't care about those. I care. I can feel it the next day. I'm like, your brain is worse right now after alcohol. And that can be two drinks, like two beers. And I feel that way. And that's the same with my food. Like I'm, I've noticed what makes me think a little bit less clearly than, than other things. And, and that's what I chase. I'm always chasing mental clarity and mental acuity in my diet. And I really feel like if you can do that and you can pick up on these things, like what, what's making me feel worse or tired or not as energetic and chase those things down, you're going to find a great diet or situation for you because what I do might not work for anybody else. Um, That's just what's working for me. I'm not saying that's how it should be done. Uh, But I think that chasing that mental acuity is is really what people should be looking at when you're trying any of these strategies that we're suggesting on the podcast. I think we're all somewhat on the same page of carb load after or get most of your carbs right after you train. It just depends on when you train. Yeah, like I don't see a purpose for carbohydrates other than that. You know, and I mean, that's my, my, uh, mechanical or robot brain. Like if I'm just sitting on, on my butt doing computer stuff, I don't need 70 grams of carbohydrates to get me through that. 
You know what right. I mean? Like when you're sitting at rest, your body should be using fat. And if all you give it is carbohydrates, it's going to try and use those carbohydrates. I'd rather it just use fat. And so that's why I keep my carbohydrates low. And yeah, I think taking most of your carbo- carbohydrates post-training is a good habit to get into for most people. Cool. Anything else on that? No. no. Cool. Let's uh, s- switch to the topic. What's the topic, Joe? Uh, it's, <laughs> it has to do with uh, impromptu workouts and workouts that you might be, you know, if you're traveling or, you know, now and away from your gym or doing things and you need a workout or if there's times where you're like with some friends or whatever and they're like, hey, let's work out. And they will all look at you because they know you work out and you're just like, oh, I guess I got to make it up. Uh, what do you do in those situations? What are your go-tos? I'll tell you my favorite travel workout first. And Murph. then I'll... <laughs> Murph's a good one. Actually, the EO three five K is great because you don't really need anything to do it. Yeah. Well, no, I'm not. I'm not taking that. That's not actually my suggestion. <laughs> you, 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 no, I didn't say that. I just said nothing. Um, <laughs> here's my actual. It's not the EO three five K. I don't like to just throw down on a five K because this one I can do in a hotel room. Like I don't have to be anywhere. Uh, like I was traveling when we met up for the for North Spartan, Carolina. Uh, yeah. North Carolina. Yeah, I had my kids in the in the hotel room with me, my two boys at least, and I didn't want to leave the room and go to like hotel gym and leave them in the room anyway. And I didn't want to bring them there. So I did, this is my favorite one. It's a hundred handstand pushups for time. (laughs) Uh, so a hundred handstand pushups, but every time you come off the wall, 20 air squats. So that's it. It's so simple and it could take a while and you can, you can scale that to whatever you need, like 50 or whatever, but it's a hundred handstand pushups. Every time you come off the wall, 20 squats, and it gets really bad, really fast, especially like you're towards the end and you're doing like two handstand pushups and you come <laughs> down and you have to do 20. It makes you stay upside down longer than you would like to. Cause you're like up against the wall, trying to rest with your arms extended, like trying to not come down where you can do more. Um, it's a, it's a pretty, pretty bad one. That's my favorite travel workout because it's really hard and you don't need to go anywhere or anything like that. So, and you can do it barefoot in your underwear, which it's how I do it most of the time. All right. I won't, whatever, whoever's next, I'm out. I'm like, that's <laughs> my favorite one. I feel like that's, I don't know. I just list, like, if I was next door to you in a hotel room and I just hear you, you cap against a wall, I feel like I would <laughs> call the no, front desk. I've learned how to do it very, very quietly. Okay. Yeah, I would just rest right. after you do your 20 air squats and not go upside down right away. That's my brain. <laughs> no, you can do that. It's, just, it's still <laughs> going to take you a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Joe's pacing. Yep. I like one man uh, one man series. Uh, there's Tabata workout that is just it's air squats and jump lunges and push ups and again you don't need any equipment and set ups and uh, Scott and I did that a few times when we'd, we'd traveled to Italy or wherever we were in Europe um, and just do that. Uh, but I wanted to say you know, three five k when you talked about training with friends or you know you're on a vacation and I do some version of it. I like it because you can scale it down. It doesn't have to be the straight up 5k. You can, you know, instead of an 800, you can scale it down to a 400. You know, I did that with our like women's retreat thing we did with the spouses here. And so I feel like the EO 35 k is great, but if you can't, if you don't have access to anything and let's say you do have access to like a kettlebell, I feel like you can do so much with a kettlebell like if you can drive maybe take a kettlebell with you throw it in the back like I feel like that's you can do swings you can do deadlifts you can do presses you can do I mean it's the possibilities are endless so that's my kind of impromptu go-to things when there's not really a ton of gear nice yeah I've done the we've done the 5k once or twice uh, including once when we were on on one of our cruises it's worked out pretty well it's nice if you're like at certain resorts or, or like, you know, cruises or um, hotels because, you know, dumbbells, you can do a lot of, a lot of crap with dumbbells, you know, get a little sexy Saturday routines in. Oh, no. I like to do. <laughs> <laughs> but if, I mean, with, if, if there's that available, we'll do that. But I also love making up intervals and I've gotten really, really good at, at doing conditioning intervals. And it's super easy and not like anything that'll be too, too crazy. If you do intervals like conditioning, running, biking, whatever, for two to three minutes, or two to five minutes, and then resting about half of that. So two to one, a work to rest. 
and get in about 30 to 35 minutes of actual work in, not including the rest, that's usually what, about what I shoot for. And it's also good because when we're at, in new places or if you rent a house somewhere, then you can use that time to like, you know, go run along, you know, a pier or a beach or whatever and like see whatever the area you're at just to get, you know, the scenery and part of the whole travel thing. And then you just do down and back. So go halfway down, do your intervals, halfway through the intervals, turn around and go back and then you're back to the start. Or if you drive somewhere to like a trail, then all you got to do is down and back that for your intervals. And like two to five minutes, you can kind of make them as hard as you want, but it's not going to be anything too crazy. It's not like you're just going uh, all out max meters for 20, 30 minutes or doing some crazy sprints that you really need to warm up to. So you can pretty much just, you know, if you're doing three minute runs, you can kind of just start your intervals right from there and then do them and that's it. And it's also really easy to make them in with certain apps like Garmin and whatnot. Yeah, and I do think Murph is a great, a great one. Um, <clears throat> how many travel Murphs I've done is, it's just, a, it's a lot. And here's the funny thing is you realize if you're trying to do Murph, you know, I always happen to be traveling on a Saturday and that's when Murph had to happen. You realize how hard it is to find a pull-up bar. <laughs> like a lot of hotel gyms, believe it or not, don't have a hotel or don't have a pull-up bar. And so like I've done, when I was doing, you know, the, Saturday can't miss Murph. I get in situations where I'm doing it on like water pipes in like the stairwell, super dangerous. Um, also like Joe, when we went to Tahoe, right. I was doing like the deck, right. I was doing pull-ups on the, on the deck. I had to jump up to the deck and do the pull-ups and, and stuff. So it was just, it's not as easy as it sounds, but that is a great one. Uh, a great workout to do. If you have access to a pull-up bar, might as well just knock out Murph. That's that's my suggestion. <laughs> no big deal. Oh, and the EO3 5K. I mentioned this when you were talking about doing it with your friends at, on the beach. Um, I have done this with people as well. Never tell them, never say the name of the workout ever. Right. Like don't say the EO3 5K because people are scared about, of a 5K. Like a 5K is something you do on Thanksgiving once a year or something you train for for like six months. Like that. that's what people think when they hear 5K. So if you're doing it with a lot of people who don't train regularly, don't call the O3 5k. Just tell them that you're going to do some running in calisthenics and then brief to them what the, Hey, we're going to run to that and we're going to come back and then we're going to do this. Just tell them that. And then when they're done, you can tell them they ran a 5k and they will feel so accomplished. Uh, but you know, uh, population dependent. So just, uh, <laughs> some people, if, if you try to get them to do that workout, it might take like two hours depending on their fitness level, but everyone else it's, it's a good workout. Anything else on that? No. Speaking of good workouts. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Ashley's got it. DiCarlo. Yeah. It's in memorial for Anne DiCarlo. She was a grad gym athlete for many years who passed away from leukemia. And it is a breathing ladder with um, not just the kettlebell swings. You have kettlebell swings, burpees, and double unders. So it's starts from one and then you go all the way up to 15 and then you descend back down to one. So you'll do one kettlebell swing, one burpee, one double under, take a breath. Then you do two of everything, then three, so on and so forth, all the way up to 15 and then back down. Um, and then if you can't keep the breathing prescription, if that's not sustainable, you need to let us know where you failed. Uh, you continue the workout as normal, but let us know where you were having trouble. Well, let yourself know in like your notes. Well, yeah, in the notes in the... <laughs> you don't need to shoot us a message about when you fail. No, shoot us a message. Shoot Ashley a message. Okay. <laughs> Just her personally. Oh, no. no. <laughs> yeah, this one... Um, so, have Joe, you mentioned you have not done it. No, I've done breathing ladders, but not this, not this one. Ashley, have you done it? No, I have not done this. I have done it... Uh, it's been a long time. I did it right after I made it. Um, and I haven't done it since, but it is, it's a good one. Like it's just good and it takes a long time and it's just I see. painful. Mm. I don't have any, I'm trying to think of what kind of tips I could give for I this say, workout. Go. I mean, you say it, go light on the kettlebell when you say that, not like super, I'm talking like if you swing, a 35, maybe stick with the 35, 53 for men. Um, 
I wouldn't try to make this a heavy one. Yeah, I've done one to 15 to one and one to 20 to one ladders with like two poots, so like 70 pound, which is my heaviest kettlebell. And since there are other movements here, I probably wouldn't recommend it. Uh, I can't recall what I used when I did do it last year. I think it was last year. Um, but it is, yeah. So that's a good one. Yeah. So really, anything? yeah, really, really get down to the breathing. So you're, on your actual breathing breaks, your allotted breathing breaks in between, really focus on slow and controlled deep breaths. And it's kind of going to be a mental battle too, because I know by the time I get to like seven or eight, that slow breathing, even though I want to breathe more, I really want to breathe in heavier, but you just can't. You have to really get in that breathing because it'll, I mean, it extends your press period some, but you're also getting more oxygen in. And you might get a little lightheaded, a little dizzy as you're trying to breathe breathing. I've, I've felt that a little bit. Mm. Um, also, when I when I would do mine is, because I've only done the, the kettlebell swings one to 15 and 20. After my, when I would breathe, I would actually sit on a box and have my arms out to the side so that my lungs can actually breathe and I'm more resting so that, it kind of helps lower your heart rate just a little bit too. And then you just stand up real quick and do, do whatever you got to do and, and go on. Also, and I don't know why this question comes up so much. You're not holding your breath during the exercises. <laughs> or or your, how many breaths you do breathe during exercise does not matter as well. It's like some yeah. people are like, I can only breathe once during this, yeah. during, the, during the one reps. I'm like, no, no, no. You can breathe as much as you want during yeah. exercise. It's you control your breathing in between the, the latter rungs. Yeah. So just get the swings out and then get, kind of get your breathing in. Like you don't need to go super fast on the on the uh, burpees. Um, so you, you can even do step up burpees if you need to uh, breathe a little bit more for that. But try and keep your uh, breathing for those normal as normal as possible as well. Yeah. So I'll I'll just reveal a little bit of the thinking behind when I programmed this. When I when I do most of the time when we do ascending or descending or both breathing ladders. It, a lot of times it's with kettlebell swings and typically Russian kettlebell swings. And it's not, it's a great way to practice your breathing and control your recovery. Breathing ladders are just good in general. I know when I first started breathing ladders with a kettlebell, they were difficult um, to where I would, so when I'm getting to like 18, like I would want to, you know, I'd get really out of breath and it'd be hard to control my breathing. Now that's, that's really subsided. I'm actually pretty decent at doing those. But that's because kettlebell swings for me maybe aren't causing as much as an oxygen deficit as they used to, aka my fitness has improved. But what I was trying to do when I programmed this was what would be the most oxygen demanding <laughs> movements I could provide, aka what's going to increase the heart rate en enough to demand oxygen. And that's why you see burpees and double unders in there. I don't know about anyone else, but anytime I do a double under, that is like a sure way to get my heart rate very elevated, very fast. And same with burpees. Like it, you almost can't avoid it. Like if you're, you're moving your entire body all the way down to the ground and you're coming back up. So this one will be difficult. And that's why there is that note for note where you failed. And if you want to continue, you can, but that is a, uh, it's very challenging to stick to the prescri prescription here, but, but do it if you can. All right. Well, that's all we have for this week, guys. Thank you so much for being a part of the community. If you would like to get access to the app and all the goods in our training, go to garagegymathlete.com, sign up for a 14-day trial, join the community. And if you haven't already, go grab that book, Killing Comfort. It's on Amazon. You can go to killingcomfort.com. Uh, check out Amazon. Also, you can get the audio book, like I mentioned at the beginning. So grab the audio book if you want to hear this voice a little more monotone, go through um, word by word by word of the entire book, aka reading it. Um, you, can, you can grab that now. It's at killingcomfort.com. Either way, guys, thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Leave us a five-star review and positive comment. But that's it. We're out. Thanks for listening to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. If you want to learn more, go to garagegymathlete.com. You can learn about our training. Let us send you a copy of our book, The Garage Gym Athlete, or you can even get featured on the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. Thanks for listening.